Imam Muslim narrates on the authority of Abu Hurairah that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Islam began as something strange and it shall return as being something strange. So good news to the strangers. Who does not want to feel like he fits in and that they belong? And in order to achieve that, we tweak our personalities and present ourselves in different ways according to the environment we're in and according to the people that we are set with. From the fear of alienation, from the fear of being given the title of Gharib, you're a stranger, you're weird. But SubhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ emphasizes that there is one thing that you should hold on to through it all, and that is your deen. You don't lose your principles when everybody else loses their principles. If everyone else in the world becomes dishonest, you don't lose your honesty. If everyone else in the world cheats, you don't lose your integrity. If everyone else in the world slanders, then you keep your tongue safe from that. If people harm each other as commonplace and as norm, you don't harm anyone. And instead, you make it a point to say that I will be from the one who is oppressed, not from the one who oppresses. If oppression becomes that which overtakes a society altogether. To hold on to what is so precious to you, your faith, your Iman, and to make it so independent of anything else that's happening around you, whether it is changing circumstances or changing trends. And what is very interesting in this regard is that the challenge becomes for the believer in these types of times to simply hold on. And that holding on in and of itself is extremely praiseworthy. When the Prophet ﷺ mentions in the famous narration that or what comes after you are days that require great patience and that patience in those days is like holding on to a burning hot coal. And the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever is going to live, you're going to see a lot of difference. You're going to see a lot of dissension. You're going to see a lot of dispute. When that time comes, hold on to my way and hold on to the way of the rightly guided Khulafa. And the Prophet ﷺ said, literally cling on to it like a person that is holding something with their molar teeth. So in one narration, you got a burning hot coal in your hand, which is like, it feels so much more relaxing to just let it go. In another narration, the Prophet is saying, look, hold on to it with your back teeth, like someone's trying to pull it away from you. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to your principles. Hold on to your deen. What's happening around us constantly is a shift. The world looks so different every year. And then the pressure on you to change, to abandon, to adapt, becomes stronger every single year. We see time and time again that liberalism becomes awfully illiberal when people refuse to abide by ever-changing, sanctified, secular norms. You, O Muslims, will be usually a minority amidst a non-Muslim majority. Allah Jalla Jalaluhu said, لَقَدْ جِئْنَاكُمْ بِالْحَقِّ We've come to you with the truth. وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَكُمْ لِلْحَقِّ كَارِهُونَ But most of you despise the truth. Most. Allah Jalla Jalaluhu said, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَقَلِيلٌ مَا هُمْ Except those who believe and they do good deeds and they are few in number. Allah said, فَأَبَى أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ إِلَّا كُفُورًا Most of humanity accept nothing but disbelief. Most. Allah said, وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِي الشَّكُورٌ Few of my servants are those who are grateful. Every time the Qur'an speaks of a majority, it dispraises it. Every time the Qur'an speaks of a minority, it praises it. A stranger amidst people who don't share your religion, and it is stressful. Many times when an imam or a scholar or a student of knowledge or an activist speaks about the prohibition of buying and selling drugs or alcohol or using interest or serving shisha in your store or something to that effect, in many instances, those who protest and object are the Muslims themselves. Many times when you speak about the ideal hijab, intended by Allah for our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, those who are first to object in some instances are the Muslims themselves. When you speak about the role of motherhood and being a homemaker as being a great profession and raise it above all in many instances, those who object are the Muslims themselves. So this brings about a type of ghurbah in the heart of the Muslim. When he sees his family, he sees his brethren speaking against him, whilst all he or she are trying to do is be a Muslim upon the prophetic path. They feel strange when they look around and they see their fellow Muslim brothers and sisters 
with their greatest aspirations in life to receive the reassuring nod of acknowledgement from society, from parliament, from friends, from social constructs. They feel strange because all they want is the acknowledgement of the king, Allah, the sovereign, and the prophetic nod of acknowledgement on the day of judgment. They feel strange when they see their Muslim brothers and sisters jumping through every hoop and wearing every mask to fit in, to not be labeled as a stranger. But for them, they hold on to their principles and values, even if it rocks a few boats along the way. And that is because society is always drumming into their heads and saying to them, you can't fit where you don't belong. So they've given up trying to fit in at the expense of their principles and they have chosen to not compromise. They have chosen to inhabit planet Earth on their own terms, on their own conditions, as practicing Muslims who will not compromise. You're actually enduring hate just because you're doing the same thing that your parents did and that your grandparents did and you're worshipping with a religion and abiding by an instruction as 1400 years old. And you didn't get the memo on Twitter that things have changed yet. And you're trying to maintain and hold on and that takes a level of endurance. And sometimes that comes with great sacrifice. And sometimes that comes with great abuse. Muhammad Ali, of course, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, one of the most celebrated people in American history and certainly the most celebrated American Muslim in history. When he refuses to be inducted into the draft, he was the most hated man in the country. I mean, he risks his career, he risks prison, he risks everything. And he stands tall and proud upon this idea that I'm not going to go kill people that did no harm to me. I'm not going to participate in the killing of innocent people. I will not go 10,000 miles from here to help murder and kill another poor people simply to continue the domination of white slave masters over the darker people of the earth. They shoot them for what? They never call me nigger. They never lynch me. They didn't put no dogs on me. They didn't rob me of my nationality, rape and kill my mother and father. What I'm going to shoot them for what? How can I go shoot them? Them little poor little black people, little babies and children and women. How can I shoot them? People. Just take me to jail. You can celebrate him now for that. And they always talk about how, subhanAllah, we're just coming now past six years after his death, that they only loved him when he couldn't talk anymore. Because what would he have said about police brutality and militarism today? And suddenly now everyone was championing him and holding him up. So that's one element of it. But also look at the other elements that don't get talked about much, which also come from the same place of being morally anchored in deen. When he refuses to put Muhammad Ali on the ground, on the Hollywood Walk of Stars, because he doesn't want people stepping on the name of Muhammad. That's a man of principle. He could barely talk at that point in his life. But I don't want people stepping on the name of Muhammad. You have to adjust. You want that star there? You feel like it's incomprehensible that people will go there and not see the name of Muhammad Ali? Well, you figure out a way that it's not stepped on like everyone else. And you go to that walk of stars and SubhanAllah, the only name that's up and not on the ground is Muhammad Ali because he refused. Not because of an arrogance with his name, but because he anchored himself in some sort of principle. People aren't going to step on the name of Muhammad SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm not okay with that. What many of us might not also know is Muhammad Ali turning down the beer advertisements. What would they have said about Muhammad Ali today if Muhammad Ali refused to wear an advertisement that he felt like went against his faith? Would they still praise him? Would they still hold him up as an icon of justice? Or would they blast him as a religious zealot? You don't have to look much further, subhanAllah, than when you look at France today. And you have a brother by the name of Idrissa Ghana Gay, who is a Senegalese French football player. All he does is he sits out a game because he doesn't want to wear an LGBTQ pride flag on his uniform, feeling like it undermines his faith. And so he was hunted down by the press and the French Association of Football. And they said to him in an arrogant manner that one of two situations apply. Either these rumors that you're not supporting the LGBT are true, in which case you are to know that there are going to be consequences for your action and to realize the impact of your behavior and to realize the grave mistake you have committed, they say to him. Or either these allegations are false, in which case we invite you to send a message of support and you are wearing the t-shirt, send us a picture. He's lynched in French media. All sorts of racist rhetoric is hurled against him. There are calls for discipline. All he did was take a dignified stance. Man said, I have Dean. This is my Dean. How do you describe his situation now amidst this avalanche of condemnation? Gharib, a stranger, is a good word to describe him. And many other Muslims who simply want to be as Allah intended. We need people of azm, people of determination, people that have confidence in their faith, people that will not buckle, people that draw from something greater in terms of strength. And my sincere nasiha 
to everyone and myself. If you have to lose everything in life, don't lose your deen. Don't lose your iman. It's the most precious thing, the most precious provision. That which you will need in your grave and that which you will have bidnillahi ta'ala when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will make all other sacrifices worth it. وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ And we all repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. O believers, so that we may be successful. Learn to compromise in everything except for your deen. Learn to compromise in arguments. Learn to compromise in your family relationships. Learn to be someone who's kind, who's courteous. Learn to be someone who's dignified in the face of insults. Learn to be someone who's always in a place of showing rahmah and mercy, but don't compromise on your deen.